We hope you enjoyed this teaching from Christchurch Birmingham. More teaching can be found at www.christchurchbirmingham.org. Okay, as Dan said, my name's Lucy, and um, the topic we're talking about today, we're introducing the topic of spiritual disciplines. And when I heard I was talking on spiritual disciplines, my heart sank. I was like, oh, because I know I'm not there yet. And spiritual disciplines is, an, is, is something that you have to keep on working at. And um, I know to this last few weeks, we've had a really difficult few weeks, and I am feeling kind of on my knees a bit, but I know that God is good. So if I start speaking gobbledygook, just throw something at me, and um, I'll get refocused. So um, I was looking at spiritual disciplines and um, trying to get a good definition of what, what it is. And... Um, This is what I came up with. Spiritual growth is God's work. If you're a follower of Jesus, which most of us are, it's an act of grace that transforms and changes you. But the fact is that the Holy Spirit is at work. But it doesn't mean we don't do anything. Yeah, it means that we have a part to play. And um, these things are things you don't respond to what God's doing. And listen to him and experience healthy spiritual growth. And these things have been called spiritual disciplines. Is it working? So I've got a quote here, which hopefully will come up in a minute. No. That's all right. So uh, the, the quote I've got is, spiritual discipline is a practice that aims to develop grow and strengthen one's spirit, character, and inner life. It involves paying attention to oneself, God, and others, and to align, in, to, to, and speaking to align with the Holy Spirit and the life of the character of Jesus Christ. It requires regularity, openness, and willingness to learn and be changed. It can be done as a community or alone, and it can enrich one's experience of grace and the power of God. You know, I know I often look at spiritual gifts and kind of think, oh, it's another thing I've got to add on to the long list of jobs I've got to do, of things I've got to do. And I'm not thinking, woohoo, I want to grow. I want to change. I want God to do stuff in me. And I was looking at, um, on the internet about a definition of spiritual disciplines. And there was loads of, and some people said there were five, some people there were seven, some people said there were, I looked, found somewhere that said there were 67 spiritual disciplines. And I'm like, whoa. So this, I put together just a very simple list of what I think are the main spiritual disciplines. So one would be study, reading, meditating on God's word. One is prayer, communicating with God. One is fasting, which means taking, not having food or other, other things for spiritual purpose. Confession, admitting and repenting our sins. Worship, which we've done this morning. Praising and honoring God. Fellowship which we again meeting this morning, sharing lives with other believers, and rest, taking time to relax and recharge. So I put up another, there should be another slide coming hopefully. That is like 20, how many was it? Was it 27 spiritual gifts that I've seen in there? And that, that's pretty overwhelming, I think. You know, so what... Spiritual, it, John Packer says spiritual disciplines are biblical principles that believers engage to grow spiritually in Christ. Unlike spiritual gifts, which are provided by the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts are more like finely honed tools that aid us in our spiritual walk. These practices allow us to remain open to God and develop ourselves spiritually. Just like athletes build strength and skill through discipline, spiritual disciplines exercise our spirit, mind, emotions, bringing us closer to God and helping us to discern his will for our lives. By practicing these disciplines, we simplify our faith, focusing on God and strengthen our relationship with him. So the spiritual gift I'm going to be talking about today is keeping the Sabbath, basically rest. Yeah? And I think we could all do with some of that. So, um, and it's, if you look at the list bef- up before, there was a little, uh, yep, fantastic. Um, it talks about all of these are things you have to do apart from rest. That's something you can just be. And, um, but it's something we have to do intentionally. And we all know how busy our lives are. You know, and sometimes it's really difficult to get that bit of rest in. 
And so I'm going to be looking at three places in the Bible where it talks about keeping the Sabbath. And I'm going to be talking about how it looks for us. And lastly, about Jesus being the Lord of the Sabbath and our Sabbath rest. So the Hebrew word for Sabbath is Shabbat, which should come up. It simply means to stop. To stop. That's all it simply means. The Sabbath is simply a day to stop. To stop working, to stop worrying, to stop wanting, simply just to stop. But it also means, as I was looking into it a bit deeper, it means to delight. And it's the two ideas of stopping, but enjoying God and our lives in this world. And I think for me, that was a real light bulb moment, because I know that in the past, I've thought Sabbath, that's something I've got to do, I've got to keep. But actually, it's all about enjoying God. And it's the two things of stopping and enjoying him. So let's start with Genesis. On the seventh day, it said God rested, and it was good. So why is a Sabbath blessed, and why was it made holy? This, you know, on the seventh day, it says that God rested from all his work, which he had made in Genesis 2, 2. And that doesn't mean that God was knackered like I am and needed a rest. You know, God, does God need to sleep? Does God need to rest? We all know he's omnipotent, is the word. Literally all-powerful. He has all the power of the universe. He never tires. And his most arduous expenditure of energy doesn't diminish his power one little bit. So what does it mean that God rested on the seventh day, that that he stopped doing what he's doing? He ceased his labours. And um, there's a doctor in the States who did a kind of research on the happiest people in the world, and he found out that the Seventh-day Adventists, which are people who follow the Seventh, who, who, who are very religious about keeping the Sabbath, he saw that they lived an average of 10 years longer than the average American. And if you add up one day a week for 10 years... You know, if, if you add up one day a week for someone's life, it adds up to about 10 years. You know, and I wouldn't mind living a bit healthier and a bit longer. You know, if I, if I wasn't going a bit crazy, I'd love to live longer. So on the seventh day, it said God has finished the work he'd, be, he'd been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from the work that his crea- of creating he, he had done. And in Psalm 121, it talks about God watching over Israel and never sleeping or slumbering. So he doesn't need to kind of have a quick nap. You know, he watches over you. The Lord is a shade at your right hand, and the sun will not harm you by day nor by night. So what's he trying to show us? Today's life is so busy, and so many people burn out. You know, I want to run the race God's called me to do. I want to finish strong. I don't want God to look at me when I meet him face to face and say, you started really well, but then you got caught up with the world. You got too busy and you missed it. God cares about us all individually and he wants us to spend time with him, but he also wants us to look after our mental and physical health. The other part of the Sabbath is God looked at his creation and saw that it was good. And the Sabbath is time to focus on what is good around us, which is God, obviously, but our family, our friends, things that are good. So the second thing I'm going to look, the second part of the Bible I'm going to look at is the Ten Commandments. And um, if you look at the highlighted bits, there's one, two, three, four verses all on the Sabbath. And it says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do n- not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servants, nor animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For on the sixth day the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and the sea and all that was in it, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. You know, why is the Sabbath in the Ten Commandments? Why is it up there with don't murder, don't... You know, what, what's so important about it? There's no other, none of the other spiritual gifts are in the Ten Commandments. Why is that there? You know, and, it, it, and what's so important about keeping the Sabbath? You know, we know, so I'm just going to kind of keep on talking about, or I'll be going back to that, but we're now going to be looking at the New Testament and see what God says about the Sabbath. And I don't know, have any of you guys been watching The Chosen? 
I've really loved it. It's been really helpful to me just to see Jesus living in the context of, 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 of daily life and seeing, you know, and you see him healing. You see him on the, on the Sabbath. You see what he does on the Sabbath. And you see in the context how much that impacts. Uh, and I, I, it says that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And again, that was another kind of light bulb moment to me, that it, is, it was created and designed by God himself, and it is for us. It's a gift for us, from the creator to the creation, because he cares for us and he knows us, and he knows we're weak, and he knows we need to rest, and it's his gift to us. So now I'm going to be looking at um, how does that look for me? You know, as shown by, the, by, by Jesus, the verses above, we're no longer under law. Yeah, we're under grace. We don't have to religiously stop everything we do on a Saturday or a Sunday. And that, that's not possible for everyone. You know? We have to be creative, and everyone has a different capacity. The Sabbath doesn't just happen to you. It takes planning and preparation. It takes self-control and a capacity to say no. You know, for example, it might be a time that you turn your phone off and don't look at social media. Or you organize having a coffee with a friend or set aside time with, you know, to read the Bible or worship. For me, um, I really started to understand the Sabbath um, when I started having mental health issues. Um, during COVID, my husband Dan got, had a mental breakdown and was off work for about eight months. And suddenly I found I was kind of living with a bit of a zombie who couldn't communicate, couldn't do very much, Suddenly I had to take on everything that he did, all the roles that he did. I had two kids at home, one doing GCSEs, one doing A-levels. And I just felt like I was on a hamster wheel. I just had to keep on going, keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. And um, some of you know that my older son um, has quite complex mental health needs. And so things got worse for him and he started trying to take his life. And I had to be, we had to, I had to be hyper-vigilant to keep him safe. And it just all became... So much, you know, and in the end, Sam was admitted to a psychiatric hospital. And when that happened, I thought, my, you know, my mental health, I just, I just couldn't do it anymore. And understanding more about the importance of rest and being kind to myself has been so releasing and has been a journey and actually not being able to do very much. And my capacity went way down. And... I think, you know, we all live stressful, busy lives, and we need to rest. We need to look after ourselves. And God is not just something that we know we should do. It's something that God wants us to do. It's not something that is, you know, it's in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I um, yeah, so I've started through that experience to, to take rest. And I, I want to thank Dan, because he's really released me to be able to stop and, and rest. And actually, that's been his way of loving me. And it has made such a difference to rest, enjoy God and those around me. You know, I'm, I'm really blessed. I've got older kids, although they can be quite challenging. I only work part time. And so I actually can. And I have the amazing privilege of having one day a week that I can actually switch off. And that for me is Friday. And on that day, I normally have a lie in, spend some time with God, take the dog for a walk might see friends. You know, it, it depends. But I've, I'm really fortunate, and I know many of you aren't in that situation. <laughs> and that, that's tough. So it's not just an opportunity to be lazy, to lie in bed all day, watch TV, but it's being intentional and using our time well. And it's different for everyone. And there are three things I think it's the same for everybody. One is it involves stopping what you normally do. Yeah, it involves stopping what you normally do. What does that look like? For everyone, it's going to be different. And, um, and it's tricky. You know, and I think of Ella Donna with two little ones. How can she stop? You know, does she just say, OK, Saturday, I'm having my day off. I'm, you know, you need to feed yourselves, close yourselves, look after yourselves. I'm, I'm just, I'm off. Bye. You know, that isn't possible. And I think it's having to be creative in thinking, how, how, can, how can I have that time out. How can I look after myself? How can I rest? What do I need to do? The second thing is it involves spending time with God and focusing what is good. Yeah? So 
how, how, how can this be done? You know, any ideas? How can you pray? pray? Yeah, okay. You know, for me, it's going on a walk in the countryside. Yeah? For me, I, I've got a dog who loves running around and just being out in Samuel Valley with my worship music on, chatting to God, it just fills me up again. So it's working out what, what is a way for you to spend time with God and focus on what is good. And it involves recharging our batteries. We are all human, we're weak, we get exhausted. And you know, or you, hopefully you are getting to know, what works for you, what charges your battery. You know, introverts, my husband's a real introvert, and he needs to spend time on his own. And that's him getting, getting his, getting his, filling his battery again. With me, I'm a bit in the middle, probably more of an introvert. And so I find actually spending time with people really builds me up. So it's working out what works for you. So is the Sabbath a duty or a delight? There's a guy called Dan Alanda who wrote a book on the Sabbath. And he said the Sabbath is an invitation to enter delight. The Sabbath, when experienced as God intended it, is the best day, time of our lives. Sabbath is a holy time where we feast, play, dance, have sex, sing, pray, laugh, tell stories, read, paint, watch creation in its fullness. It's, you know, it, it's, it's huge, and it can be however it, well, you want it to look, really. But we have to change our mindset from it being a law, of being something that we have to do, to actually the amazing grace, the amazing gift of God giving us time out, giving us time to rest. It shows, again, how much God loves us and wants us to the best for us. You know, he knows we're weak and frail and we get tired and weary, and he wants, to have time, well, he wants us to have time to enjoy him, his wonderful creation, the gifts he's given us, and recharge our batteries so that we can run that race he's called for us, so that we can finish strong. And one of the ways to do that is to keep the Sabbath, is to rest. So... Changing tack a little bit, we're going to be talking about Jesus being Lord of the Sabbath. So uh, the phrase Lord of the Sabbath is found in Matthew 12, 8, Mark 2, 28, Luke 6, 5. And in all these instances, Jesus refers to himself as being the Lord of the Sabbath. In these verses, Jesus proclaims that he's the one who has or exercises authority, even over the rules and regulations that govern the Sabbath. So, so what does that mean to us? As creator... God was the original Lord of the Sabbath. He has the authority to overrule the Pharisees' traditions and regulations because he created the Sabbath. He has authority, and, and the creator is always greater than the creation. You know, furthermore, Jesus claims to have authority to correctly interpret the meaning of the Sabbath and all the laws regarding it because Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He's free to do with it as he pleases. And in a sense, for us as well, it's not a rule, it's strict following rules. Yeah, it's not, you've got to, every Saturday, all day, you've got to have a Sabbath. It isn't that. It is a, it's about living that restful life. It's about having rest. And that might be every day of the week you have a bit. It's completely being creative. And so as the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus has the power, the right and authority to follow in any way he wants. The Lord of the Sabbath has come and his death and res it, with his death and resurrection, he became the fulfillment of our Sabbath rest. The salvation we have in Christ has made the old laws of the Sabbath no longer needed or binding. When Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, Jesus was also saying that just as a Sabbath day was originally instituted to give man a rest from his labours, so he came to provide us rest from labouring to achieve our own salvation by works. Yeah, I know for me, in the past, I found it really hard to say no. I've done everything, and it's all been due to my insecurities and me trying to work out my salvation. And actually, Jesus died on the cross, so we don't have to do that. So, because of his sacrifice on the cross, we can now forever cease labouring to attain God's favour and rest in his mercy and grace. And how amazing is that? God bringing peace and rest. And I know for me, the only true rest I can find is in God, is in Jesus. You know, I feel like the last few weeks I've been in a huge, great storm. 
But I've been in the eye of the storm, in that little bit of quiet and peace because God has been holding me and I have found rest in him. And whatever circumstance, whatever situations you guys might be going through, God can bring rest and peace. And you can know that. And it's because of his death on the cross. So, so in um, another quote from Hebrews, it says, there remains then the Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his work, just as God did from his. Let's therefore make every effort to enter rest so that no one will fall by following their example of, of disobedience. You know, Jesus died on that cross. He came to earth as a human, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and he chose to die on that cross for our sins so that we could know him and we could know rest. And it is the most amazing thing, knowing God's rest. You know, you can be in turmoil everywhere, but actually, when you know God's rest, it completely changes the whole situation. So, just going over the main points... Keeping a Sabbath is important for our well-being and growth as Christians. But it's also not something religiously we need to do because we're no longer under law. But it should be something we seek to do so we can love God, love our loved ones and the world around. It makes us more fruitful by looking after ourselves, by resting. You know, husbands and wives, think creatively about how you may be able to free up your spouse to take Sabbath rest. How's that going to work? Families, think about how you can support your family members. Friends, think about how you can support each other and encourage each other. Church, family, how can we support those in the family who don't have family around so that they can keep the Sabbath, so they can have rest? We need to be creative and accountable to one another. And this isn't a legalistic thing. It's an opportunity to live more fulfilled, productive, balanced life. And that's what I want to live. Think about how can I spend time with God during this time and what recharges my battery. So that's me done. But I would really love to pray for a few people. I've got a few people I'd like to pray for. So if everyone could stand.